I'm uh, uh, John Canalopoulos, I'm an ophthalmologist and I'm uh, medical director of our center here in Athens, Laser Vision Institute and uh, clinical professor of ophthalmology at NYU Medical School in New York. Keratoconus is uh, uh, a very common problem in, the, uh, in southern Europe and the part of the Mediterranean that uh, we practice uh, here in Greece. Uh, just uh, anecdotally, I'll mention at the University in New York, when I was full-time, I saw about 30 to 40 severe keratoconic patients a year. In our center in Greece, we see about 30 keratoconic patients a week. Um, so the incidence in the uh, Western literature is one out of every um, 2,000 people will have clinical keratoconus. We can see in uh, cornea topographies keratoconus in uh, almost one out of uh, 80 people in Greece. Um, so it, it has become, me as a cornea surgeon, um, a special area of interest and we've worked extensively in um, propagating um, new uh, venues for collagen cross-linking that has proved to be a tremendous tool in stabilizing keratoconus and uh, uh, giving all these young patients uh, better visual function without requiring a cornea transplant. We see here a normal cornea with astigmatism. The top part of the cornea and the bottom part of the cornea are symmetric. So if we separate the cornea in half, there's symmetry. And of course, looking at maps that, look, that show us thickness of the cornea, there's enough thickness. And these are maps that show us the shape of the cornea, the front part of the cornea, and this is the back part of the cornea. So these come from 50 sections of the cornea that are analyzed by a computer. And um, in the image uh, in the back, uh, here we can see clearly a cornea that's irregular. This part of the cornea protrudes more. Uh, there's no symmetry. And if we look at the pachymetry maps, the thickness maps, the thinnest part of the cornea is not in the center. And you can see that the back part of the cornea shows also a concave area that goes along with the front part of the cornea that shows the protrusion. Uh, so this is keratoconus. Uh, it's very common in um, uh, southern Europe. Uh, it's very uncommon, fortunately, in Asia. But of course, uh, uh, big countries like China and India have, uh, due to the very large population, have big centers as well uh, that uh, uh, address and deal with keratoconus. Um, usually, keratoconus, when it progresses, manifests as advancing myopia and advancing astigmatism. Uh, so when um, a person typically between 18 and 22 needs stronger glasses every year and uh, more astigmatism in their glasses, then uh, the cornea, in my opinion, needs to be mapped to make sure they don't have keratoconus. But unfortunately, a lot of people with keratoconus, because the cornea is so soft at that early age, they can just squint their eyes a little bit and correct the problem. So they don't realize how significant the keratoconus is until much later. So when they reach 25, 30, and the disease starts to slow down, and they can't use these, uh, these uh, empiric uh, ways to, get, to overcome it, then it may be too late to make that diagnosis. So very few symptoms. Usually distortion of uh, the picture at night, the lights have tails, and uh, myopia or astigmatism that progresses rapidly from year to year. It's interesting, and we've studied even um, um, identical twins, that the uh, progression and the expression of the disease is not the same in everybody. So you can have identical twins that one twin has more keratoconus than the other, and they're genetically exactly the same and usually grow in the same environment. So there's many factors that, have, that uh, uh, come into play in the development of keratoconus that we don't yet know. We definitely know that eye rubbing has a lot of things to do and may contribute to keratoconus or patients that have high enzymatic activity and allergy end up rubbing their eyes a lot and they progress uh, in keratoconus. So in young boys especially that uh, present with allergic conjunctivitis, allergy in their eyes, usually in the spring, we have to have a high index of suspicion when they become um, uh, 12, 13, even if their allergies go away at that age, to um, uh, evaluate them for keratoconus. So allergies is, um, is an area that we need to look more carefully for keratoconus. Patients that have eczema or atopy, it's a special type of allergy uh, that uh, have higher percentages of keratoconus. And uh, mainly patients who have somebody in their family, 
uh, father, uncle, grandfather who no has known keratoconus, in my opinion, need to be evaluated uh, for keratoconus. We have uh, been fortunate to uh, been working in our center uh, over the last 15 years with topography guided laser and uh, we were um, uh, the first center in Europe, uh, non-university center that worked with uh, collagen cross-linking from 2000. So we were able to combine the two modalities in reshaping the cornea, the irregular cornea, and using high-fluence collagen cross-linking to stabilize it. And this technique that we um, proposed and introduced back in 2005 has become now a worldwide option for treating keratoconus. It's called the Athens Protocol and it combines topography-guided normalization of the irregular cornea with laser and then stabilization. It's a technique that's practiced in China, India, uh, millions uh, of uh, keratoconic patients there and thousands of procedures, but all over Europe uh, uh, and North and South America uh, and Africa as well. So I think that uh, the key thing here is uh, hereditary predisposition. So anybody who has keratoconus has to be alert that all the, especially boys in the family, sons, nephews, and girls, but girls, uh, boys are one uh, to five in incidence, should be checked when they're in puberty, so ideally around the age of 15 uh, for keratoconus, and if diagnosis is made, then uh, uh, collagen cross-linking can be employed if it's progressive and stabilizing this for the rest of their lives. Usually if uh, a patient has keratoconus and uh, has not become a clinical problem until they're 40, it's not a significant clinical entity. So we see everyday patients with very mild keratoconus at 50, 60, and it's just interesting, but it means nothing for them, it has no clinical significance. Uh, but from a center that uh, is well known now globally for the work that we've done with keratoconus, and we've published over 50 papers the last 10 years, and 30 book chapters, and this is like almost 500 presentations in the major meetings over the last 10 years. Uh, the key thing is early diagnosis, very good mapping of the corneas. We map every patient that we see, regardless of the reason. Every patient that comes into our office comes, uh, becomes uh, mapped for keratoconus, and that way we can pick up even the most uh, subtle uh, cases. But I think uh, as a transplant surgeon, uh, that for many years uh, the only solution was to watch the disease and then if it's too bad perform a cornea transplant We have better options today, and uh, it's very exciting